Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this lunchtime's session on Analyze Bus Open Data Service. This afternoon, we're going to be looking at managing data quality in the service and answering all your questions or trying to. Um, we are recording this session. Um, we'll uh, share you the link to the recording uh, in a couple of days so you can review what's been said when you uh, need a bit of a re refresher or share it with colleagues that can't be with us live. Um, and um, we really do need your questions. Otherwise, this is going to be quite a short um, event. Um, and so please do feel free to uh, use the chat and um, once um, the ETO team have, uh, have given a bit of an introduction and things like that, then we'll open it up um, as well to, uh, to, to audio. Um, we are running this um, today um, on behalf of Department of Transport um, and their technical provider, uh, ETO World. Um, and um, for those of you that haven't come across Artig before, um, we're a, uh, a membership body for people interested um, in public transport technology. And we've got a whole range of things that we do, events like this to help educate people, uh, and make sure that people know what's going on. Uh, as well as developing technical standards and guidance to help people implement standards and technology generally state of the nation type stuff. Um, and we do a lot of work with the DFT and the devolved governments to help them understand what's going on in the industry to help make better policy decisions. Um, but you've not come to hear about Artig and what we do. You've come to find out about the Analyze Bus Open Data Service. And so we've got the ETO team with us this afternoon. And so um, here to, uh, to tell you uh, a bit about um, ABODs and answer your questions. We've got James and Patrick and Lisa from ETO who are going to do the uh, the the detail on this and the heavy lifting. So I'll hand over to James, who I think he's going to front this for Ito, at least to start with. Yeah, thanks very much, Tim. I hope there's not too much heavy lifting um, and that this is really more about um, your questions rather than us presenting. But I think just to set the context and what would really help me understand the audience and, and your level of familiarity with ABLE would be some questions. So the first one, and if you could just raise your little yellow hand uh, if it's a yes. So how many of you know what ABOD is? OK. Pretty good. Is there anyone that doesn't? Maybe a few people that don't or some people that don't know where the yellow hand is. Um, OK, how many of you have used ABOD before? Right. And how many of you have used ABOD in the last, let's say, two weeks? Patrick's doing it from Ito. Not sure that counts, but thank you. OK, that's yeah, that's that's all right. Um, OK, thank you very much. That's that's really helpful. So as I said earlier, the, the purpose of today really isn't isn't so much for us to present to you and to tell you what Ito is. Um, happy to do that another time, but really is to, to, to hear your feedback and get your questions um, because all good products are built with users at their core and and a real focus on the value that we can provide you because 
that is that is the point of the exercise. But I thought I'd just start with a brief overview of ABOD um, and in particular to show the new vehicle journeys feature, which some of you may have seen. It's quickly become the, the by far and away the most used um, part of ABOD. Um, and then a couple of things that are that are coming very soon. And, and specifically, I know this webinar is is focused on data quality and and so I, I wanted to talk about that straight up and and since I and by the way I'm the product manager for ABOD I forgot to to say that um I joined about five months ago and, and very quickly it became clear that the, the single biggest issue with with ABOD and and by extension BODs was trust in the data um and this was this was pretty apparent fairly early on that this was going to be the thing that that we needed to sort out before you know anything useful really would come from ABOD and it's the foundation of any analytics platform whether it's Google Analytics or Mixpanel or whatever it is you need to believe in those numbers that you're seeing in order to 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 gain value from it and then and then take action on those insights that you're getting um and I think we can break down this trust in the data into two separate sections one is is sort of transparency. So why are the numbers the way they are? What are the parameters? What are the calculations you're doing? We do not want ABOD to be a black box where people don't understand why the numbers are the way they are. We, we want to have all our cards out on the table. And the second is, is more on the objective data quality. Now, obviously, uh, the data is coming from, from operators and being uploaded to BODs and ABOD reflects what is uploaded to BODs. Um, so there is there are, are some kind of um, predictions being made and, and there is a matching algorithm of course but 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 generally um that is that is the kind of the, the hard data quality if you if you don't get updated and complete data going in it's very difficult for, for ABOD to to kind of fill in the gaps um so without further ado and so yeah I, I just wanted to to briefly talk about a couple of things we're doing to hopefully address that it is our is our main focus it's our absolute priority is restoring trust in in the data on ABOD allowing you to shine a light wherever you want and um, to drill down to understand the context to understand the parameters so that over time we hope that you will come to trust in in what ABOD is saying and, and we can improve 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 the platform together um so I'm just going to share my screen quickly and show you vehicle journeys for those of you who haven't seen it it's a really interesting and, and powerful tool. So this is the dashboard that any of you have used. It will be familiar with the default now is to timing points. Um, some people were concerned before that it was all stops, which obviously changes um, the data somewhat. Um, we're doing some. Point. Yes, so, of course. Yeah, no, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I, I, I get it. All, sorry, Richard Lake, Bunch Quality Manager for West Yorkshire. First. Hi, hi, Richard. Um, I asked Tess because she was she was up in Leeds speaking to Dean Biggin a, a week or so ago, and John Burt was allowed to see us on the call uh, about timing points, and I believe it captures destination timing points. If we sub, if we submit our data with the destination timing point as a timing point, the timing point figure on here will will capture it. So any any journeys that arrive early or outside the traffic commissioners one minute early we'll we'll get we'll look worse than we actually are when we don't necessarily have to report on destination timing points okay yeah i mean that's that's interesting it's something i i didn't know about lisa or patrick have you got any understanding of this one um yeah i was just i was just going to ask and yeah hi richard so i'm patrick i'm one of the uh, support engineers uh, working on on analyzed bus open data um so yeah i just wanted to quickly check what what you mean by uh, just destination timing point is that where you're referring to the, the terminus stop which only has an, an arrival time and not a, a scheduled departure time apologies if i am getting if i'm misunderstanding yes. That one, yeah. Yeah. So for a terminus stop, so you know, obviously any stop at the end of a journey is a timing point. Um, but because it won't have a departure specified in the static data, we do not allocate um, any on-time performance to to a terminus stop. So uh, terminus stops should not have um, should not have any on-time performance in in the ABOD service. 
Yeah, yeah that's yeah. correct. And and again, this is this comes down to the data transparency issue I was talking about before. We need to make that clear that the last stop in a journey is not contributing to on-time performance. Neither is any instances of no data. So we're only calculating punctuality of the data we receive. So wherever you see yeah. no data, missing AVL feed, whatever it was, that does not contribute to your on-time performance. Okay, that's disappointing. Um... <laughs> We need to find another reason than as to why we, we look so early when we're not. Um, okay, thought we had it, we had Yeah, so it won't be that one. Um, it, you know, there are there are various reasons. It, it could be that your other providers are using different parameters. Um, it may be that they're using two minutes early rather than one minute. That's a big thing that we've seen. We're, we've got a tool actually that allows you to compare what it would look like if you were using two minutes early as opposed to one. Um, I'll show that in a second. Sorry, so, just to add, uh, just to join in on that one. Yeah, we I raised a number of calls with uh, it's Ian, sorry, Lancashire County Council hi. about running early and there's, there's <coughs> at timing points. And and to be honest, with the services that we were reporting on, there is no way they could have been running early because of the of the rural service and the way they timed. So there is a, a massive question mark over the accuracy of that, and whether it's and whether it does take the departure time from the timing point stop as being the actual time rather than the arrival at that stop because if they do wait the time out <clears throat> it doesn't seem to be reflected in the in the ABOD's data well, so, yeah uh, Ian, hi yeah. i was i was just going to ask and i i know obviously we've had we, we've exchanged kind of e emails on 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 time performance quite on a kind of number of occasions is it all right if you mind sending the service and operator for us to have a, maybe a closer look at the vehicle journey level just to see um what we've categorized the on-time performance of the of the time point stops and then maybe take a look at the gps ping times as well just to see whether there are any discrepancies there okay it's an open call but yeah i'll, I'll forward it on to you patrick yeah <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks, no Ian. I'll, Thank put, I'll put an email address in the chat chat now. OK, thanks. Sir. Yeah, I mean, it, on these kind of instances, it's really useful if we can get specific instances where we can go away and really drill down into it using vehicle journeys and pings, and then we can really understand if there's a problem, why it's not matching up to what you expect, what your other service services are saying. Um, because, you know, we, we need to narrow down the, the issue. So I'm just going to for those of you who haven't seen, I'm just going to use a stagecoach service. Um, I checked this one already, so it doesn't reflect badly on stagecoach. That's you, someone. This one. So as you can see, you beat these. Um, Grey ones are bus stops and the black ones are pings and you can see exactly when they've been received. Again, it automatically defaults to timing points and of course you can change it to all stops. And then this here, we've had people wondering how we calculate the actual departure. Are we rounding it down? Are we rounding it up? What are we doing? Um, in fact, what we do is we just remove the seconds. So if it's three minutes late and 10 seconds, it would just say three minutes late. Um, and you can then see the calculated delay here is three minutes and five seconds, which has been rounded to just three minutes. So we've got that. And then at the bottom, you can see the key so that the line on the map is color coded and this was largely on time. Um, just just to jump in on this one, and because I I'm don't. in again, oh, on the basis in. that I'm usually pretty keen on uh, complaining, and there's probably Tim will laugh about that one, but I must say, I must say to you guys, this is an excellent piece of kit that you've developed there, and, and to such an extent that we're looking at using this for our BSIPs, but if there could be a further development so it can be output in a more uh, in a regulated pattern or for a day or for a, a period would be fantastic because yeah, yeah. it is it's a bit of a game changer for us and yeah hats off because it's a good one this one and, and that's, that's and that's actually great. been recorded so there you go <laughs> 
Lovely. Um, if you wouldn't mind maybe explaining just a bit more um, in an email or we can have another meeting offline about exactly what you would use this for and then we can have a think about the changes that we need to make in order for this to, to be more valuable to you. I mean, there's, I imagine, going to be things about exporting and reporting this data and being able to share it around. But obviously, if you need to be able to see the data at different increments, um, yeah, that, that kind of thing is all very much doable. We're iterating the vehicle journey. Um, this was released, I think, in early December. So we, we've been doing user interviews and, and we're going to start really iterating this in the next couple of months and improving it as we go. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts about um, how this could be more useful for you. Okay, okay great. Thanks. No problem. Thanks, Ian. Um, okay, cool. And then the other bit about corridors. I mean, I'm sure you've all seen corridors, but this was a, a pretty simple um, thing that we did where we just allow you to edit corridors. So previously um, you had to create a whole new corridor if you wanted to change just one aspect of it. Um, and obviously this is this is going into the corridor, which allows you, you can see here the shape data isn't correct. Again, this is something that we're working on is to, to be able to trace more accurately um, the route rather than just a straight line between stops. Um, so you can see here the, the data on the corridors and then we've got some various different charting. But the bit I wanted to show you was um, just this edit button. So if we just go into this one, um, I can edit any aspect of the corridor um, and then save it either as the same or save it as a new stop. Um, for those of you who haven't uh, seen the corridors feature, I'll just create a new one. Interestingly, we had someone on last time who was from Oxfordshire County Council and uh, knew the route extremely well that I'm about to show you. So uh, this is another feature we've added is the ability to search by location. So you, you don't necessarily have to know the Naptown code or the exact name of the stop. Um, and you can also select the stop by the map, which I'm sure most of you guys will know the Naptown codes or the names of the stop. But there are people who use ABOD who uh, are not so familiar with these kind of things and, and want to be able to just click on a map like that and then that becomes the first stop in the route and then I can carry on adding stops until I feel like finishing. Previously we had a hard limit of 10 stops to per corridor. This has now uh, been removed so let me just search for that one. Um, Burford 5 and then you can see this is the corridor and hopefully when it starts loading. I mean, maybe it's because we're doing it for so many days. Let's try seven days. There we go. And people questioned the average speed of 43 miles an hour. I can confirm that that is an accurate reflection. It is an, it is an A road. Um, and then we've got speed down here on the charts. So I feel like I'm I've taken up 20 minutes. Um, I'd really like to hand it back over to you guys. I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions. We've already had some really useful and interesting questions. Um, is that Jeff with his hand up? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Jeff. Yeah, um, you say that you don't estimate uh, or you estimate stocks. Um, a few minutes ago. Well, I've got emails from Lisa saying that you don't estimate them. So which one's correct? So there's always a degree of estimation in the stops. So you can, unless there's a GPS thing exactly on the stop, it's very hard to tell you that the bus was at the stop at that time. But if we have pings either You're side of the it. stops, but you're making an estimation on that stop and you say and you're telling me and I've got the you've sent me emails personally telling me that you don't estimate them. Yeah, it's quite clear from this that you are estimating them. I think I I mean, I, I haven't looked at looked at the email, but I what I imagine Lisa was meaning to say was that um, there will be there will be a degree of fitness that we have to meet in order to allocate an actual for for that for that stop. And so but it's, we. But it's still an estimation, though, isn't it? 
It's not a, in, it's in not certain cities. Cor- in cer- it's not a correct. Um, it's not the timing isn't correct because it's an estimation. Now, for well, I mean that work, work pro- for the thing to work and the thing to work properly, then you need accurate information, not estimation. Now, where we are in a rural location, and I've spoken to you quite a lot about this. Okay, our data. 80 70 80 percent of our data is there is none so mm. everything that we see the majority of that is estimated so that's not a true reflection on how that service is operated it can't be because it's purely estimations but i would say that we're we're not necessarily estimating but we're more inferring so th- there is always a degree of plus or minus in, in any calculation and unless we had people on the street with stopwatches and even then you know there is a latency between your the, finger press pressing the seconds yeah but you've got the ticket machine sending ping data every few every seconds. 30 seconds yeah. every well, 30 seconds so. right so it's sending ping data all the time now if there's no if there's no gps signal and we mm. discussed this again previously if there's no gps signal there's no ping data because it can't do it. So therefore, there's an estimation made. Now that vehicle might have arrived at that stop two or three mm. minutes beforehand on time. You estimate the ping data, therefore it arrives late. Or the opposite way around, you'll estimate that he's arrived early based on what he's already done, when in fact he's on time. Now, it, that doesn't work, that doesn't make sense. It can only work if it's th- accurate information. It does, yeah. It, it all, yeah. It, it does. Highly, it highly depends. The, the accuracy of, of the on-time performance displayed in Nabod it is obviously very, very dependent on the quality of the data that's going into it. And so, if there are kind of obviously, you know, low signal areas whereby GPS pings can't be um, sent within you know within a regular time frame of every 30 seconds or or better then you know the accuracy or output of the on-time performance in abod will you know will will vary and you know won't be as 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 accurate in comparison to um gps pings up for a regular so they will be they will be they will be in inference to to the allocated actuals in in those kind of scenarios And and then we're accountable if we don't meet um, the, the the minimum on time performance, potentially there's issues there. If we're not doing what we should be doing, or seem to be doing what we're doing, uh, doing properly. Now, if that data isn't correct, and we get an issue in the future where there's a penalty levied against the company because they're saying that we're not not operating correctly and not operating on time, et cetera, et cetera, then who pays that fine? We pay that fine, not you, but you're so providing- You're not going to be, Jeff, can be I just be clear that you're, you're not going to be punished because of your ticket machine's uh, faultiness or, or the inability? On all the, di- the inference on all the government websites is that if bus, com- bus operators don't provide accurate information via yourselves, et cetera, et cetera, then there is a potential for penalties to be levied against the operator. Now, that's but the DVSA, but the it, DVSA but has confirmed, the DVSA has confirmed that they're not using this for penalties and they have confirmed this multiple times and this should have gone out to all operators to say they're not using ABOD for any penalties. Right, well, we've never seen anything. Uh, also, I'd say it's one to speak to your ticketing company about because even if you live in a rural area where there's no uh, there's gaps in the coverage, the ticket machine should then upload data when it finds coverage later in the day. No, we're not seeing that. We use tickets. Yeah, who, yeah, they should. That ticketer do do that, and they should they should be doing that. So they yeah. should cache all yeah, the data that they that. We do, we don't see that since I started using bods um some time ago now we've never ever seen that at all 
Yeah, that's one to speak to. T I mean, obviously, this is out of our hands because it's data that's going into pods, but I, I would speak to Ticketer about that because they should be able to do that. Right. And then this thing about shapes data, we've noticed that we're seeing shapes data on some of our services. Okay. But, I mean, you're saying it's just something that you're working on. It, I'm not sure I understand. So shapes data is something that can be sent to bots and it's something that we can then show on our maps. Um, we show it in some maps and there's others that we we haven't got that capability mm -hmm. yet. Shapes data also uh, is only useful if everyone is sending it um, really. So um, there are other things that we can do about inferring if a particular route is adhering to the scheduled route and that then allows us to draw the map that it we've been told it's going to go and we can set a radius around pings to check if the pings are going on the road that it says it's going to these are all things that we're hoping to do but ultimately what we want to be able to do is plot the actual route that the bus is going rather than straight lines that are going through buildings and over fields which clearly is wrong 100 percent of the time right um tim you've got your hand up yeah yeah it doesn't matter anymore okay john thanks james can i just get a bit of clarification then so um early on you said missing data are not included in the punctuality reporting so by missing data do you mean data that might be missing for a bus for a day because it's gps box has decided not to work or for a service or do you mean missing data for a particular timing point that's a that's a good question and so i guess i guess in in short it can it can be both but um so let's say hypothetically we're looking at a specific vehicle journey say a you know the 9 10 journey on a tuesday morning um we will to our best ability um allocate on time performance to each and every stop you know intermediate and timing points but there may be um there may be a case along that journey whereby we don't receive um a regular enough gps pings to provide an accurate allocation an accurate uh, actual for the stops that it's proceeded through so there might be say 15 stops along a specific vehicle journey and we were only able to allocate actuals to 10 of those 15 stops so it's on a, a stop by stop basis so um like we were saying with jeff earlier we we might be recording a vehicle journey but we might not always allocate an actual to each and every stop because there, there are parameters in which we we try to provide like actuals as accurate as possible so in that example we may have actual times for 15 stops. Let's assume all these 15 stops are timing points. Mm. For the other five, would they show up as no data or would they be estimates? They would be no data, yeah. So if if we can't accurately determine um, the, the departure time from, from those five timing points, then they would fall under the no data category. Okay, that's good. So then just going back to your answers to Jeff, you suggested that a timing at a timing point might be estimated on the basis of the performance of that journey to date. So in that case, if there were no data for that timing point, what you just said means that that should be recorded as no data rather than an estimate. Can you just confirm that, please? So there's essentially if if say, you know, there's there's quite a significant gap in the updates surrounding a timing point, um, you know, it doesn't meet our kind of scoring for accuracy, then you know it's 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 kind of on a very individual basis whether we are able to provide an actual for that. But let's say hypothetically we haven't had an update for five or six minutes or maybe four minutes. Um, those are kind of sometimes a level of gaps that we're often seeing in the GPS updates. Um, then if there is a timing point in between 
that kind of four or five minute gap, then we won't be able to allocate a, a, a departure time from that timing point. OK, so that's helpful. I think my concern is that if, as often happens during the course of a journey, signal is lost and the bus is no longer able to send an accurate message, then it is possible from what you're saying, but but will not always be the case that the next timing point might be recorded as early if the last ping from the bus was early. Now, the reason this is so important that we need to understand this is, of course, that we are measured in terms of punctuality on our departures yeah, from yeah. timing points. Yeah. And yeah. it's fair, I think, to say that a lot of us are seeing results that indicate a far higher degree of early running than we would sanction in our operations. And mm. we're trying to all understand why that would be the case. Because if the yeah. performance was that bad, we wouldn't deserve <laughs> to have an O license. Um, yeah. So we make sure that we don't run early. And therefore, trying to understand why these instances of early mm. running are being recorded is, is absolutely critical for all of us. And I think this may be part of it, from what you're saying, mm -hmm. that we need to yeah. dig into further and just understand yeah. whether this estimation yeah. process is causing, I'd call them almost false negatives in this case, yes. rather than false yeah. positives. Yeah, I'd, and... It's, def it's definitely a valid point and we're not we're not trying to to negate it in any way we you know you you're expressing concerns that other operators and local authorities have brought to our attention um i guess the hardest part for us in terms of investigating it is that we really do have to kind of drill down to a very specific vehicle journey where by say john that you've but you know you know, with confidence that there is a lack of pings and we have allocated an early departure for the timing point. So if what I would recommend to, to, to everyone who obviously has, you know, operators within their ABOD organisation is drilling down in the vehicle journeys feature down to a specific trip level and where you know for a fact it, it looks it looks suspicious or or perhaps a discrepancy, then please do forward it on to us and, and we can take a further look then. Thanks, Patrick. As I think you're already aware, or, or certainly ITO World are aware, um, FIRST is doing a controlled experiment looking at the comparison between ABOD, our um, ticketed data, and a, a further independent determination of punctuality from a system we've got called UTRAC. Um, and we will, we are probably about a week or so away from having both uh, an overview of what the mm. overall stats are, but also a deep drill down to exactly what you say, that journey by that bus on that day to determine why these differences might be occurring. But yeah. your explanation just now has been most helpful in trying to understand why there may be discrepancies that we really cannot account for. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and hopefully we'll we'll be able to work together to improve this as we uh, we get the results of our analysis. But thank you. That's been really useful. Thank you. That would be great, John. If you could, if you could share some of the results of that, and and then that can inform some of our product development going forwards. Because clearly, we want this to work for you guys. And you know, there there is a, a, a very strong feeling that there is something amiss here, and that is based clearly on on what is actually being seen in reality. So we'd be childish to ignore it and say no, this is this is correct. Like something's going on. So, and it and it's because it's such fine margins, and it, there's a lot going on and it's quite complicated if we if it's something like that something seemingly small and and that has gone unnoticed then let's try and work out exactly what it is if if we can find the exact vehicle journeys where we think this is happening and we can and then we can start solving it yeah of course we will certainly thanks james amazing thank you um i just thought i'd i'd answer simon's question at the top about the slowness in bods so the the cavil system which is the the kind of centralized avl system we subscribe to the same operator feeds as as you would if if you want to see an operator feed but obviously um we're subscribing to lots and lots of feeds um so uh there is 
an element of latency that's that's expected and and not only that are we are we taking in a whole bunch of fees but we're also writing them to a database um so yeah it is it is going to be a bit slower than if you were subscribing directly uh to an operator fee but it wouldn't be causing any any issues so unless we've got again if we've got specific examples of that kind of thing great we can go in and have a look at it but um yeah i thought i might just mention that um, Lisa, do you want to pick out? So I haven't been looking at the questions in the chat. Is there any that that you feel we should talk about? Um, no, I don't think so. Obviously, there was the one about um, Ian asked about penalties and if um, we could get something more concrete from DVSA. So I'll reach out to the contacts of DVSA. Yeah, no, that's all. Think at the moment. Simon, could you maybe talk through your? I think that's your most recent question about internal RTI software. I feel like this might be an interesting one. So Simon messaged me a minute ago. He said his call dropped, so I can see that he's still showing uh, the participant list. I wasn't sure if he'd managed to get back in okay. or not. Um, so I'm happy to sort of do my best to try I, and explain. I have, I have just oh, sorry, oh, he's, no, back. he's back. He's back. He's back. <laughs> I'm having serious problems. So I've had to log in back in on my phone. <clears throat> um, what was there a question for me? Oh yes. So, so I, I just I. I just wondered if you could um, explain the, the question about your internal RTI, RTI software and amending GeoGate's geofences, because this is the geofences issue is something Lisa and I have discussed uh, recently with the DFT and that we were wondering uh, whether we should expand them. Yeah, uh, so they, used to be, they used to be 50 metres, I think. Yeah, and the thing is, is, yeah, maybe expanding them sort of on a general basis will help. But you know, in some areas that won't help because if you've got lots of stops close together in a town centre or whatever, they might be overlapping, yeah. and then you get an issue. Um, yeah. But so you know, if over over the years when we've seen sort of a lot of early running for a particular stop or something like that, we would go and look and go, oh, I wonder why it's doing that. Oh, it's there's a lot of high buildings around there. Maybe it's you know the GPS ping, and you look at the pings, and they're all over the place. So you might extend the geo. Um, fence or in some cases we use geo gates so we can sort of do it directionally so they sort of enter a specific zone over here and they have to do it directionally and then they exit um you know uh, further down the road and occasionally you know you have situations where the bus comes down the road goes past the stop round a roundabout comes back the other way hits the stop uh, you know in some systems it'll pick that up on the geo as entering the geo fence then exiting it and record that as a departure when it hasn't actually arrived at the stop yet. So I think it's the fact that it, I was just trying to point out. I don't think it, there is a one size fit all, fits all. You could you can increase everything to fifty meters, but then you're going to have other problems elsewhere. You know, the, uh, you need to be able to go down the, to stop level in some cases for specific. You, know, uh, you know, at a stop level. Um, do you, do you, do you mean to to be able to see the geofence at a stop level, or to adjust the geofence at a stop level? Uh, both. I mean, I'm not saying you know it might not be on operators to adjust it, but at least if we would be able to drill down and say, oh, oh this stop's got a lot of early running. Why do we think that's happening? We think it's because of a geofence issue, and oh look, we can see it. That will be why it's happening. Because normally, when you can see a visual representation and you understand the area, or maybe the GPS pings or something, you can. You can figure out what's the likely cause, and then it may need be that that needs adjusting in that specific case. So Lisa and I have actually been talking about whether we show geofence radius on on your maps. So it's 25 meters for every every bus stop, um, but whether it's useful for us to show that on the map so you can see whether the pings are in and out of the the geofence. But then we wondered whether it might just cause more arguments because if the ping is right on the edge, you know how, what's in and what's out to what granularity can we go to can we go down to a centimeter and then the, there's some latency with the with the ping like how accurate is the ping to within a millisecond you know it, it opens up a bit of a can of worms but maybe it's more useful than it's not useful yeah i mean i mean we've certainly found it you know without if we hadn't done that you know with our own rti systems we'd have had there's areas where we continually get things showing as early running that aren't we know aren't early running and it, we know it's just because of that specific location 
You know, if it was okay. 25 minute stop or, or whatever, it would appear that, you know, it, often it's where there's a lot of layover. You know, in yeah. a town centre, you, you, the bus is sat there for 10 minutes and there's a high building. It's The GPS is going to ping out of that stop at some point if it's 25 mm. metres. Mm. Um, um, Tim, have you got your hand Yeah, up? I have this time. Um, so um, this is one of the reasons why NAPTAN has a bearing associated with each stop to help with some of these things that Simon's talking about. Um, and so you can usefully use that um, hopefully at a national level quite easily for uh, geo gating um, with inevitably we know that there are going to be some issues with some of those bearings and things like that but if we can help flush those out as part of this process then that will help a number of other people using the NAPTAN data and overall improve the, the quality of information across the board so uh, it's worth exploring that and that is why the bearing field is in there fundamentally to help track this down because it was identified 20 years ago mm -hmm. Um, I wonder if it might be worthwhile just showing you a couple of uh, prototypes we've got for this data transparency issue. And obviously, again, as, as John has pointed out, there are certainly going to be ways in which we can improve data quality and data accuracy. But there are also ways in which I, th I hope we can improve the kind of transparency and the understanding. And the last thing we want is for people to go into ABORD and go, I don't know how they got that. I don't know how they got that number. I don't know what the parameters are. I don't know why, how they're measuring that. And that, unfortunately, I think is a, is a large part of the feeling at the moment. It's like I, we don't we don't know where that's coming from. This affects our company and our livelihood. If you're gonna if you're gonna give me these numbers, we really need to know where they're coming from. Um, so there's a couple of of tools we've got, and and it, you know this is not the end of it. This is this is the start of of many many things we're doing in order to to improve that sense of transparency so i'll just um share my screen so the first one is um on time performance parameter adjustment um and it's a pretty simple tool that allows you to compare what you're seeing in abod sorry i'm just gonna expand this um to potentially some of your other um, softwares and just change change the threshold. So uh, you can obviously change early and late. This is what the, the OTC are looking at, but you might say that oh, we're going to change it to five minutes and then you can compare and see what your parameters look like. And then obviously you can do this um, not only for um, all services. Uh, how do I get out of here? Um, but you can also do it for uh, again, single operator, and again compare my thresholds. So that's a, a kind of a simple thing that we we're releasing in the end of March, possibly early April. And then this is the other part, and this is again a really important part of what we're trying to do. Is it's a knowledge base, I guess. Um, it's this kind of help section. I remember doing a user interview with someone in my kind of first couple of weeks and saying that he wished Abel came with an instruction manual. And it's a fairly complicated bit of software. I mean, there's not there's not a huge amount of features on it, but it it's doing complicated things with with large numbers, big data sets, and it doesn't come with a manual. Uh, and so we're creating a manual and and hopefully we're going to align this with what BODs are doing so that all definitions are the same across the board. A service means the same thing on BODs and ABOD. Um, the parameters are clear to everyone. There is little room for ambiguity, which um, there currently is at the moment. So again, this is a help section. It will relate to exactly what's on your page. So we can have definitions of early and late and what an average delay means and how we're doing um, AVL matching and, and that kind of thing. Ignore the fact that the, the writing sort of blended it into each other. We're, we're changing that and then how departure times calculated. So it's a sort of FAQ as well as um, user guide all in one. And then this is the question that people always ask. 
when I talk to them, how do you get to these numbers? And so we're going to have more information about exactly how we're doing that. Um, and currently this is set to the same sort of stuff, but this this bit here is highlighted. So how are we matching schedules to AVL, which is how we get punctuality. So it's a work in progress. I hope that these kind of small changes go some way to showing you that this is our absolute priority now. Um, we know that there is an issue with trust in the data and we are doing everything we can to address that. Um, so yeah, any we've got sort of 15 minutes left. Has anyone got any questions about future developments? Any questions, concerns they have, any feedback, things that they love, things that they don't love? I think whilst we're waiting for people to uh, to have a think, it's worth reiterating that because ABODS uses the data that goes into BODS, if you've got timetables that haven't been updated in BODS but have been on your ticket machines, particularly if you're using journey numbers and codes uh, and running boards, um, then the results that you see in ABODs aren't going to be what they should be. So maintaining your data accurately and up to date in, in BODs is probably the biggest thing that you can do to, to help improve the quality of the results that you're seeing in ABODs. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I think that's a that's a really good point. And it's um, something that we're trying to do, certainly with with ABOD, is to increase the visibility of the link between BODs and ABOD. And it's it's clear that some people some of the time don't understand where the data from ABOD is data in ABOD is coming from. And we need to make this link between BODs and ABOD super clear and that you can click into BODs from ABOD to edit your data and you can click into ABOD from BODs to go and look at your data. They are two sides of the same coin. And it's really important that that, that is reflected in the respective platforms. And currently, I think they feel quite separate. OK, um, if there's no more questions, I might give you guys back 10 minutes. Um, but this has been really interesting. I think we've had some some really good questions, some really good feedback. We've got lots of work to do, um, but we're going to get there. Um, if any of you would like to talk um, in a sort of smaller session, just either with me or with, with me and some of our developers or whatever, about your experiences with ABOD, ideas you've got for improvements, concerns you have for, for how it is currently, um, please do get in touch. I hope that there is an email address. I think Lisa's put one in the chat. It's support at etoworld.com. Um, I'm sure many of you have been, been in touch with Lisa and Patrick and, and the rest of the team before. They're extremely responsive. Um, so any concerns or questions? Thank you, Lisa. As I say, responsive, it gets posted. Amazing. Um, so yeah, get in touch. We're always happy to help. And as I said at the beginning, this kind of thing only gets better um, with feedback from the people that are that it that it's being built for. Um, and and my last point to mention was that um, I think ABOD is often seen as a sort of tool of um, bureaucracy or legislation, which you know, of course, in part it is. But I think there's an awful lot more value there than just uh, a stick to kind of beat up operators with at least i hope so um and i think that the, the more trust that you have in the data the more you can find value in it um and the other thing to note is that i hope that we're switzerland in in the in the fact that we're neutral we are agnostic we're not kind of we're not trying to penalize anyone we're just reflecting what gets sent over by bod's data um, but yeah, I think that's that's probably it. Yeah. So before we uh, let you go, um, we have done over the last couple of years um, a whole series of events on ABODs um, doing, whilst it doesn't come with a user manual, um, if you want to find out how to, to use it fundamentally, 
for example, there's a uh, recorded introductory session to it. If you want to understand corridor functionality, there's a session on that. Um, and um, they are all uh, available with links on the uh, RTIG website. There's a page for all of the uh, previous sessions, but also a list of the future sessions. So next week, um, there's a deep dive into vehicle journeys, for example, and uh, towards the end of the month, um, something on using ABODs to support uh, bus service improvement plans and enhanced partnerships. So uh, there's a whole series of sort of things to try and encourage people and understand how to uh, to better use it. So uh, please do uh, uh, bob onto the page and uh, and have a look at the uh, the bits of functionality that perhaps you want to understand a bit more. Um, thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you to um, Patrick, James and Lisa. Uh, and to you for all of your questions. Uh, have a good rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tim. Thank you for watching this RTIG webinar. To find out more about RTIG and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.